It's my honour and privilege to rise to speak to this motion brought forward by our party. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, why are we hearing increased calls for a just transition in energy, and what's the trigger? As my colleague has clearly stated, this transition is being driven by a rapid pace shift in energy investments away from non-renewable power to renewable power sources. IRENA, which I'm happy to hear Canada after three years has finally joined again, reports that 60% of all new power generation capacity deployed worldwide has been in renewable power. So that's the direction. While investments have slightly fallen off uh, recently, 263 billion US dollars in 2016 were invested in, in renewable capacity. And the capacity continues to build, and in fact we need lesser investments because the costs are declining and policy shifts towards uh, cleaner energy are actually driving that. IRENA reports that the greatest investor in renewable power has been the East Asia Pacific, with China the main driver, as well as Japan, South Korea and Israel. Canada has also committed to deep carbon cuts along with other nations to address climate change and to reduce harmful pollution from burning fossil fuels, along with the G20 partners have promised in perverse subsidies to fossil fuels but clearly failing to deliver with the recent billions invested in a pipeline. Some provinces have already committed to substantial percentage of renewable energy generation, for example, Alberta to 30% and Saskatchewan to 50% by 2030, which will mean a lot of deployment of renewable energy. American think tanks are determining that a clean energy portfolio combining energy efficiency, reduced demand, storage and renewables is the lowest cost option to retire thermoelectric and even better cost-wise than natural gas. In the European Union, renewable energy is on track to be 50% of energy supply by 2030. Globally, the renewable energy sector employed 8.1 million workers in 2015 alone, with an additional 1.3 million workers employed in large hydropower. As the CLC has reported as early as 2013, 37% more Canadians were working in the renewable sector than in 2009, amounting to over 2,000 jobs. Germany has just committed to a more fast-paced phase-out of its coal power and greater reliance on renewables in parallel with a just transition strategy for its workers. Across the EU, renewable energy is on track to be 50% of energy supply by 2030. Globally, the renewable energy sector employs 8.1 million workers, as I suggested. This is the growing workforce of the world. So this is what sustainability looks like. So how do we get there? Why is a federal action for a just transition for workers necessary? Well, without foresight in action now, there is a real potential for stranded workers and stranded communities. Just transition won't just happen by itself. Many are already being laid off with downturn in world oil prices and divestment by major players. Workers and their families and communities are stressed. It's critical to commit to a transparent, inclusive planning process that includes measures to prevent fear, opposition and intercommunity and generational conflict. People need to see a future that allows both security and genuine opportunity. And with deeper investments in renewable power sources and energy efficiency measures. We need parallel investment in training and retraining. As Samantha Smith from the Just Transition Centre in a report for the OECD has said, in quotes, a just transition ensures environmental sustainability as well as decent work, social inclusion and poverty eradication. Indeed, this is what the Paris Agreement requires. National plans on climate change that include just transition measures with a centrality of decent work and quality jobs. As the ILO Director General has said, in quotes, environmental sustainability is not a job killer, as it is sometimes claimed. On the contrary, if properly managed, it can lead to more and better jobs, poverty reduction and social inclusion. The International Energy Agency is quoted in its World Energy Outlook as early as 2012 saying, in quotes, Energy efficiency is widely recognized as a key option in the hands of policymakers, but current efforts fall well short of tapping its full economic potential. Tackling the barriers to energy efficiency investment can unleash this potential and realize huge gains for energy security, economic growth and the environment. And I might add, to job creation. Globally, the renewable energy sector employs millions of workers. So who has been calling for action by the federal government on just transition? Well, in at least the last two uh, gatherings of the world leaders in the COPs on climate, the featured topic has been 
for workers and public, a call for investment in a just transition for workers and communities. At the 11th hour at the last COP in Berlin, Canada's Environment Minister was pressured to commit to action. The Minister finally, in the third year of this government's mandate, created, guess what, an advisory committee. At, yet the last three budgets have made zero reference to a just transition and zero dollars committed specifically to targeted skills training for the new energy economy. And if I can quote the Canadian Labour Congress, in quotes, climate change is real and its impact on working people and their children will be immense. No amount of wishful thinking will make this challenge disappear and we have limited time to adapt to changes and prevent further damage. Business as usual policies and relying on market incentives will simply not spur this transition with the speed and scale required to avoid catastrophic climate change. And they certainly will not deliver fairness for workers and their communities. So who are these workers and what are their demands? Well, Mr. Speaker, they're oil field and gas workers. They're coal field workers. They work in coal fire power plants. They are seeking job security in this evolving clean energy economy. And if I can just share a few of those stories, which have been compiled by Energy and Earth. This is from D. Lee, a unionized trades worker. In quotes, my work history involves field level oil extraction jobs on drilling rigs and other field services for those drilling rigs. I've become an electrician so I can participate in the world's energy revolution. Liam Hildebrand, boilermaker. In quotes, I've been a boilermaker for over a decade and have proudly built a number of renewable energy projects with no retraining required. Give us the blueprints and steel and we will help Canada address climate change with our industrial trade skills. Mr. Speaker, these workers are demanding federal action, but not, they are not just sitting back waiting for governments to act. Iron and Earth, oil and gas workers partnered with members of the Louis Bull tribe of the Muscogee Nation in Alberta to train workers to install rooftop panels. Their goal is to upskill over a thousand oil, gas and coal workers as well as indigenous community members as solar specialists. We have some similar uh, successes in Sook First Nation and other indigenous communities. Iron and Earth in collaboration with Energy Futures Lab, Pembet Institute and Kangia and others have issued a worker's climate plan, a blueprint for sustainable jobs and economy and have issued a detailed plan calling on this federal government to invest in to revise the pan-Canadian climate strategy to address workers' needs, to act on the union's calls for a green economy and skills survey. And I note that Eco-Canada, that has existed for decades, financed at the federal level, has been doing market analyses on environmental jobs, and they would be perfect to lead this work. They want research skills gaps filled. They want focused short-term training programs. They want a workplace training fund. Um, they want energy manufacturing market analyses. They want support for incubator programs tailored to collaboration between contractors, developers and unions seeking renewable solutions like the Energy Futures Lab based in Calgary. Their concerns are that other nations will fill the void if Canada doesn't step up to the plate and finance this retraining. All of Canada's unions have shown the initiative and the willingness to work forward. So can the federal government at least finally release their uh, regulations to speed up the shutdown of coal-fired power? And can they please release now funds to feed this, this workers' fund that can transition them to the clean energy economy? Questions and comments. Question and commentaire. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I believe the government has recognized the importance of uh, changing over to a, a greener uh, economy and energy. Um, and we've seen that in terms of uh, budget announcements by uh, indications from uh, both the Minister of Natural Resources and uh, the Parliamentary Secretary and other members where we've highlighted many of the things, actions that the government has done in regards to that uh, transition. What is a bit uh, surprising and somewhat disappointing is that the, the NDP, at least here in Ottawa, have made the decision that they are, their, its pipelines are an absolute total no-go. Yet you have, for example, the Premier of Alberta, who is fighting for those union jobs and many others uh, to protect uh, by having that pipeline extension. And uh, yet we have the New Democrats giving a very strong message. I can understand the Green Party. I don't necessarily understand the national uh, uh, NDP on this issue where they're saying no to pipelines. They make up they, you know, the excuse, well, we want more consultants, more consulting, and, and, and so forth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> the bottom line is, is the NDP have given up on the province of Alberta. 
And I think that's a very clear message that need be, needs to be uh, made. And the member herself is an NDP MP from Alberta, uh, Mr. Speaker. And my question to her is, does she not uh, appreciate that there is a national interest at stake and supporting the NDP in the province of Alberta is a good thing. This is a good thing for Canada's environment and jobs. Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to have the same amount of time to reply. Um, yes, I'm very proud of my province and I'm very proud of my Premier, Rachel Notley, and gosh darn it, Rachel Notley already issued the jobs transition plan and committed $50 million. Yes. This yes. government has done nothing, not one cent towards the jobs transition strategy. Just another study, just another consultation. <laughs> absolutely want to provide jobs for the future. I could read off here a hundred quotes. I could read off a hundred quotes from oil field, coal and gas workers. They want retraining so that when the new economy comes, what happens after that pipeline is built? If built, then what? Where are they going to work? They are begging this government to invest in the retraining. Uh, comments, the Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. Mr. Speaker, and thanks to my Honourable Colleague from Edmonton Strathcona and to the NDP for bringing this motion before the House today. My question to the member for Edmonton Strathcona, given her long engagement in the climate issue, and we recognize we were together at the Paris negotiations, we were together in the disaster in Copenhagen. We know that climate action requires rapid reduction in fossil fuel emissions, or we will go above the Paris target of 1.5 degrees. I asked my honorable colleague if she believes we can expand production of greenhouse gas emitting facilities like more oil sands production, new pipelines, <laughs> new oil wells, and still meet the Paris target. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. I'd like to thank uh, my colleague for her question. Certainly we can't if this federal government doesn't also invest in other alternatives. Yep. And so everybody likes to beat up on my province, Alberta. But where is this government? The Conservatives promised regulation on oil and gas didn't deliver in 10 years. This government keeps promising, oh, just wait, just wait, the rest of our pan-Canadian is coming. And then sit on the monies that the provinces and territories and indigenous communities have been waiting for to get off diesel, to transition their workers. Uh, no, I do not believe that we will meet those targets unless we have considerable action by this federal government, not just sitting back and waiting for the provinces, the municipalities, the territories, indigenous peoples to carry the load. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Sarnia, uh, sorry, Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, thank the member from South Kona. Um, one of the things that we've heard earlier also is that it's important that we meet their international international commitments. Um, and and what, I, what we never hear, though, is what we've tried to hear from the find out from the Liberal government, is that to impose a carbon tax, so pen, to penalize those industries that actually are creating the jobs, we're asking, what's it going to cost a family? What's it going to cost the small business? Now, we know they know the cost. They just don't want to share that with Canadians. But just taking a hypothetical case of, well, we just need to improve without having any facts about, one, what the cost will be, and two, if there is actually, what are, what are the degrees of environmental increase or improvement that will happen? And so knowing that Canada is such a small producer of greenhouse gases, I'm wondering, does the member actually have the numbers of what it's going to cost? and what the benefits are in terms of its drop in terms of greenhouse gases. Member for Edmonton Strathcona in 30 seconds or less. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, I find it really bizarre, this fixation of the Conservative Party on the carbon tax. What was the first jurisdiction in Canada to put a price on carbon? Alberta! Yeah. Yeah. Under a Conservative government, working closely with the oil and gas sector. The oil and gas sector of Alberta have been on board day one on imposing the cost of production and investing in cleaner technologies. But they themselves are divesting. Major corporations formally investing in the oil sands are shifting from renewables, shifting to investing in other jurisdictions. Because this government has not shown the, the signals, we're here in Canada would like you to invest in renewable energy for the future for Canadians.